The image I show here is a finite element analysis of a rather tall and slender helical coil spring. There are 20 coils in this spring. The major diameter, that's capital D, is one centimeter. The wire diameter is one millimeter. I fix the bottom side coil and I apply a load to the top side coil. When I do this, you will note, if you look carefully, that this spring experiences a buckling deformation. That is, the top side of this spring is moving off to the right in this image, and the bottom side stays tethered. So we get a curved, buckled coil spring. This is one of the failure modes that we have to consider and we'll talk about in the remainder of this lecture. When we are designing with coil springs, it's really important to keep in mind that under the influence of a compression load, these coil springs could, instead of elastically deforming, they could buckle. We need to come up with a buckling criterion for these elastic springs. I show a simple representation of a coil spring over here where I apply a load to it, and that thing could elastically deform. Pretty bad drawing, but nonetheless, you get the idea. It could elastically deform under the influence of that load, or if I just look at the center line of it, it could buckle, just like column buckling. In springs, we introduce a critical deflection. So this delta becomes a Y critical, which is a deflection in the loading direction that then would lead to a buckling deformation rather than further simple compression of the helical coil spring. The critical displacement for buckling is going to depend upon the free length of the spring, some elastic parameters C1 prime and C2 prime, and the square of the effective normal length of the compression spring. You can think of this as a slenderness ratio of the spring because it is composed of the free length divided by the coil diameter. That's a normalized dimension. And you multiply that by a constant alpha. That alpha is an end condition. How are you supporting the ends of the coil spring? This becomes a normalized effective length. You plug it into this equation up above and you use these elastic constants, C1 prime and C2 prime, which are simple combinations of the elastic modulus and shear modulus. And from that, you can calculate a critical buckling displacement. Now we can create really nice buckling maps if we take this critical displacement and divide it by L naught, the free length, and that becomes equal to the C1 prime times 1 minus 1 minus C2 prime over the square of the effective slenderness ratio. That is raised to the 1 half power. And we can take this Y critical divided by L naught, and we can plot that against this effective length and come up with maps that separate safe elastic loading from the buckling state for the springs. And that is exactly what I've done here. I have taken that critical buckling deformation, Y crit, normalized by the undeformed length of the spring, and plotted that against the normalized undeformed length divided by the coil diameter for different end conditions. The blue line is a fixed fixed end condition. This orange line is a fixed pin. The gray line is pinned pinned and the yellow line is fixed free. For each of those end conditions, slenderness ratios to the right of that line would buckle and slenderness ratios to the left of that line would not buckle. This is called a wall buckling map. Well, 10 2 in the Shigley textbook provides this end condition constant alpha for a number of different support conditions. If the ends are fixed at both the top and the bottom, then that alpha constant is 0.5. If one end is fixed and the other is hinged, then the constant is 0 0.707. If both ends are hinged, well, in buckling of columns, we call it pin. So if both ends are pinned, the constant is equal to one. And if one end is clamped and the other is completely free, this alpha constant is two. Now that we have this equation, 
that allows us to figure out what the critical buckling displacement is for a spring of unloaded length L sub zero based upon these elastic coefficients and this effective slenderness ratio, we can ask ourselves the question about what is the condition for absolute stability? Well, if you look at this carefully, you'll notice that if this second term becomes negative, then the square root of a negative number is a complex number. And so this is not defined as a real number any longer. And that means we have absolute stability. So we get that absolute stability if this elastic constant C2 prime over the square of the effective slenderness ratio is greater than one. And so let's go ahead and manipulate this a little bit that the C2 prime has to be greater than this effective slenderness ratio squared. And so I put the square term in there, L naught squared, capital D squared. And now I'm going to have to substitute for this C2 constant. And I'm going to just rearrange this a little bit. I'm going to get L naught squared has to be less than D squared times C2 prime divided by alpha squared. Well, C2 prime is just equal to prime, you'll recall, is 2 pi squared times E minus the shear modulus over twice the shear modulus plus the elastic modulus. We put all of those things together and we find that the condition for absolute stability is that the unloaded spring length has to be less than pi times the coil diameter divided by alpha, which is the end condition constant, times twice E minus G over 2G plus E. E, all of that to the one half power. So there is our condition for absolute stability.